had lunch with several, especially Jess, and he gave me a gift. A Ziploc bag, batteries, gag batteries. I'll cherish them. Tell them about the sign. One more song? Still back. No. No. Okay. He did not tell you there was a sign in the bag that said gift not included. <laughs> And it makes a great gift for a graduating senior. <laughs> the last night of the meeting, it's good to be with you. Uh, I've enjoyed the week. So many familiar faces, um, meeting new friends, and it's always good to be with the brethren. I appreciate Brother Chris, Brother Greg, and directing the song service for this meeting. Again, I want to express my great appreciation to the eldership of this congregation uh, for the invitation to come your way. As I mentioned at the outset of this meeting, I was and am humbled and honored by that invitation. And thank you so much for that. When it comes to the end of the gospel meeting, that speaker has enjoyed and hopefully the members have enjoyed, we come to a period of mixed emotions. There is that uh, an anxious feeling of getting back home, getting into the old routine at the same time, uh, having to say goodbye to those who are here. Someone says, well, preacher, you can't have mixed emotions. Well, you can have mixed emotions. Someone defined mixed emotions as the man who watched his mother-in-law drive off a cliff in his brand new Lexus. <laughs> Turn with me, please. First Peter chapter three. Beginning at verse 18, Peter writes, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing. For in view, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure were in food and baptism that also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. As we introduce the topic of study for this evening, I want you to know that the thief on the cross is one of the most popular cases of conversion to come from denominational churches for many centuries now. We've all heard the argument. We've all did our best to try to answer that argument. The argument usually goes something like this. Well, since the thief on the cross was saved without being baptized, then I can be saved without being baptized. So the thought struck me that if I could show to denominational and interdenominational preachers how 750 people were saved outside the ark, it would give their preachers 750 brand new sermon outlines, and that poor thief on the cross could take a well-deserved vacation. And if anybody is deserving of a vacation, 
it would certainly be that thief on the cross. Now, in order for you to understand the lesson title, it's very important that you understand the introduction to our lesson tonight. If you miss the introduction, then you will go away thoroughly confused. I'm going to give to you a crash course in hermeneutics. I remember at the old Preston Road School of Preaching, stepping into the classroom for the very first day in a class of hermeneutics. The teacher began by saying, who can tell me what hermeneutics is all about? One of my fellow students said, well, that must be a eunuch by the name of Herman. Well, that's not quite right. The word hermeneutics actually comes from a Greek god of mythology known as Hermes. He was the interpreter for the other gods and especially for the Greek god of mythology known as Jupiter. So hermeneutics is a study of how to properly interpret, how to properly interpret, and it can go into the field of law, it can go into the field of science, it can go into the field of medicine, it can go into any field virtually under the sun. And it's very, very important when it comes to biblical hermeneutics. There are certain rules, certain principles that have to be followed. And of course, when you begin to study, uh, you are already using hermeneutics. You may never have had a study in, in a course of hermeneutics, and yet you use it all the time. When you recognize that a particular passage of scripture is literal, bigger did, that's hermeneutics. When you realize that Peter or Paul wrote a particular passage, that's hermeneutics. When you notice the place to which that letter is being addressed, or uh, the place where the writer of that letter is at the time, that's hermeneutics. All of this is involved in a proper understanding of the scripture. Now, of course, in a detailed course of uh, hermeneutics, you would talk about necessary inference, direct command, apostolic example, the law of exclusion, the law of inclusion, and the list would go on. But mark it down, you would be in a study of typology. In a study of typology, there will always be a type and there will be an antitype. And that's what we're going to discover in our text this evening in 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter writes, the like figure, now if you have the American Standard Version, it reads, after a true likeness. And in my American Standard Version of 1901, the teacher's edition, there is a footnote for after a true likeness, and that footnote reads, in the antitype. So there is a type, there is an antitype. The type is going to be found in the pages of the Old Testament. The antitype will carry you over into the New Testament. And when you look through the type, it's always going to be physical, temporal. When you look through the antitype, it's going to graduate to a spiritual application or a spiritual meaning. Now, there are many, many types that you have studied through the years as you have attended Bible classes and listened to fine gospel preaching. And when you listen uh, carefully, uh, there are those lessons that we have learned through the years. Maybe you were in a study of the tabernacle and you were shown how the tabernacle became a type for the church. Or maybe you were in a study of the life of Joseph, and you were shown how Joseph was a type, and Jesus Christ was the antitype. And then again, uh, you think about Adam, who is called the first man, and then uh, Jesus Christ, the second. And, and so typology is something that you are very uh, familiar with as you go through the pages of Holy Writ. Let me give you one quick example. If you turn to Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 and following, you'll remember you 
will remember that uh, on that occasion, God was very displeased with the children of Israel. And in that displeasure, he sent uh, serpents among the people. And the serpents bit the people, and many of the people died. And as those people died, they came to Moses, and Moses went to God to intercede on behalf of the people. God took Moses to the side and instructed him to make a, a serpent of brass or a brazen serpent. He was instructed to put that serpent up on a pole, and the people who had been bitten by those serpents would come and look upon that serpent upon the pole, and thereby they were cured. They were healed uh, of the snake bite and would not die. Now you go to John chapter 3 and the verses 14 and watch what happens very carefully. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You know, it's a shame that you go to football games or basketball games or baseball games, and you see people holding up signs all over the stadium, John 3.16, John 3.16, John 3.16. John 3.16 is truth. John 3.16 is a powerful truth. But when you separate it from verse 17, you miss the meaning. You miss the intent of those words. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but, the work, but that the world through him might be saved. Oh, how we need to keep verse 17 attached where it belongs to John 3 and verse 16. But that brazen serpent became a type. Christ on the cross is the anti-type. It, it is a physical salvation in the Old Testament, but it is a spiritual salvation in the New Testament. If you turn to John 12, verse 32, Jesus is speaking again, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. God never uses one prophecy as the fulfillment of another prophecy. And neither does God use one temporal blessing to typify another temporal blessing, but oftentimes a spiritual blessing. And, and that is all involved in the type and the anti-type. Type in the Old Testament, the anti-type in the New Testament. So let's contrast this lesson of typology and I'm going to emphasize throughout this lesson the number one. One. Remember, this will be a lesson in typology. There had to be a builder in the type. And sure enough, we find that that builder is Noah. God gives the charge to Noah, and it is a charge that Noah himself must carry out as the builder of the ark. You're going to need to turn to Genesis chapter 6 and chapters following in order to keep up with the lesson from this point. God was ready to destroy the entire world. The wickedness of man had become great upon the earth. God was so upset that he was ready to destroy man from off the face of the earth until we come to Genesis 6 verse 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah is called a preacher of righteousness when we turn to 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 5. And he does preach. And in his preaching, he is able to save his own family, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. And so Peter says that eight souls were saved by water. Well, that being the type, 
we expect to find that when we turn to the antitype and a builder for salvation, there will only be one. And sure enough, that one is Jesus Christ. As Noah built that ark to the saving of his household, Christ Jesus built his church to the saving of his household. We studied it in, a, in another lesson from Matthew 16, 18. I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against her. So there's going to have to be a vessel of salvation. And we're going to discover that when it comes to a vessel that is designed for salvation, one salvation is temporal or physical, but the other is going to be spiritual. And Noah does build one ark. There is not one ark for Noah and his wife and another ark for each of his sons and their wife. There is only one ark. There's not more than one ark. Now we understand that because the text is clear. In Genesis 6 verse 14, make thee an ark. That's a singular ark. That is one ark. Also, I want you to notice that several verses follow that will say, the ark. <clears throat> the is a definite article. What does a definite article do? It points to a particular person, place, time, event, or they, but it's always singular. The ark. And over and over and over in these pages, you'll read about the ark. And there's only the one. Christ needed to build a vessel of salvation, and it is the church. One ark in the type, one church in the antitype. In Ephesians 4, verse 4, we find that there is one body. That one body is the church. We know from Colossians 1, verses 18 and 24, that the church and the body are one and the same. In Colossians 1, 18, and he is the head of the body, comma, the church. So the church is the body. The body is the church. They are referring to one and the same institution. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, I want you to notice for his body's sake, that's body apostrophe s sake, which is his church. It cannot be made any plainer or any clearer than that. The church that Christ built is his body. And that body is indeed his church. You turn to John 17, and Christ prays for unity. And if you want to read the real Lord's Prayer, you go to John chapter 17, not Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and following. And there is the one church. In the religious world of our day and our nation, there are now in excess of 750 man-made religious bodies. Organization, religious organizations, each one claiming to be a way that will lead to eternal life in a heavenly home. But let's see what happens in the time when it's time for the material. First to the type. And the direction of God is very clear, it's very plain. Look with me, please, at Genesis 6:14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. God spells it out. Gopher wood. Now you can read about generic wood in 31 books of the Bible. But the terminology of gopher wood is found in one verse in the entire Bible. And this verse is it, Genesis 6, 14. 
you will not read anywhere else from Genesis to Revelation about gopher wood. This is the one and only occurrence. When God said gopher wood, he meant gopher wood. I suspect many people would have said to Noah, well, Noah, just use the wood of your choice. Use the wood that, uh, that you like, the wood that you prefer. I mean, as long as the thing floats, that's all that really matters. But when God said gopher wood, he only said it one time. And when God says a thing once, that's it. I remember in 33 years of Christian camp work, having a, a, an occasion when the young people uh, on, on the campus were singing, a, a, or really chanting, I guess you'd say. The Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. You know, that's good. But I explained to those young people that it's really not quite right. The Bible says it, and that settles it. Whether I believe it or not, if the Bible says it, that settles it. It's not a matter of, oh, I agree with the Bible, therefore the Bible is right. No, like the late great brother Marshall Keeble used to say, the Bible is right. The Bible is right. And whether we believe it, or whether we disbelieve it, it's not going to change the truth of God's word. Well, there's going to have to be a material, and only one material, that is going to have the uh, pleasure of God. Christ is the one who founded his church. And as the one who founded his church, there are those who are going to follow in his footsteps. And when we follow in the footsteps of Christ, that is, obey his will in all things, and we're going to obey him and become a Christian. A Christian is one who is a follower of Jesus Christ. And that means obedient follower of Jesus Christ. Christians, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, you also as lively or living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So the church is made up of all of those who have been obedient to the command of Jesus Christ in Mark 16, 16, who have done what those 3,000 did on that notable day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And when it comes to the mode of baptism, uh, that is settled by the Apostle Paul in Colossians 2, verse 12. Having been buried with him, that is, with Christ, in baptism. So baptism is a burial. In Acts 11, 26, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. In uh, King, King Agrippa, in Acts 26, 28, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. In 1 Peter 4, 16, yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed in this name, but let him glorify God in this behalf. And so the material in the type is gopher wood. And the antitype is going to become a New Testament Christian. And there will be no departure from that. Well, how about the entrance? Do you see how we are emphasizing the number one throughout this entire study? The entrance to the ark is the door of that ark. And the scripture is plain. You would need professional help to misunderstand it. In Genesis 6 and verse 16, the text says, and the door, definite article D again, the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. So God has demanded but one door. He gives us instruction to Noah that there will be that one door and not a whole bunch of doors. And you know, lots of religious people today just don't get that. They would suggest, well, you need all sorts of 
different size doors. You need a big door for the elephants. And you need a tall, you need a tall door for the giraffe. And you need this medium-sized door for lions and tigers and what have you. And there's gonna have to be a little door somewhere way back at the back of the ark just for the skunks. And, and so everybody would come up with a, a door here and a door there and a door everywhere. God said, one door, only one door, not more than one door. That's the type. So how about the anti-type? Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the entrance. I am the way in which man can find salvation. When uh, Jesus was speaking in John chapter 10 and verse 9, he states very clearly, very plainly, I am the door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Now, if you back up earlier in that chapter, uh, the very first verse of that chapter, actually, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth, entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Christ, believe it or not, was narrow-minded. He said, I am the door. That means there is no other door. There is no other way. There is no other entrance that you're going to find that will lead you to a home in heaven. Well, of course, there's going to have to be some source of light in that ark. And sure enough, God is very specific. How many windows do you think you could find in the ark that Noah built? Only one. We know that because of the text, Genesis 6, 16. A window, a window shalt thou make to the ark. If you have the American Standard Version of 1901, a light shalt thou make to the ark. And in Genesis chapter 8, verse 6, Noah opened the window of the ark. So you see, there's only one window. There's not a whole bunch of windows, only one window. Now again, many religious people today would say, well, everyone needs their own viewpoint. Everyone needs their own vantage point. And I, I want this vantage point over here, and they go after this strange doctrine. And someone says, I want this vantage point over here. They go after a whole different doctrine. No. There's only that one vantage point, and that is one window. Now, you aren't close enough to see, but if you could get up close to the arc that's on the board, you'll notice that there is one window and only one door. And you Bible class teachers know that when you're looking for an ark that has only one window and only one door, it's getting harder and harder and harder to find. So Betty Lukens will help you out. This ark has one window. It has one door. I was teaching a class in Genesis many years ago. Sweet sister in the congregation, Sister Ruby held up her hand. I called on her. She said, Brother Jess, that ark had a first floor, a second floor, and a third floor. When they got down on that bottom floor, if there's only one window, how did they have light enough to see? I looked at Sister Ruby and smiled and said, well, Sister Ruby, everyone should know that. They use floodlights. <laughs> there is only one light only one window. So what are we going to discover when we go to the antitype for illumination, for light? We have the Bible. We have the word of the living God. We know that God's word stands alone 
as the source of authority in all religious matters. We live in a religious climate where men want to bring in man-made doctrines, man-made commands, man-made teachings, man-made creeds and manuals, and it becomes wearisome. I often say when I'm teaching and preaching, God wrote only one book, and that book is the Bible. There is no other. The Book of Mormon is not written by God. The New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witness is not written by God. The Noble Koran is not written by God. And you can go on and on and on with the man-made books that are put up as being the religious authority in religion after religion after religion. But my Lord and my God wrote only one book. And it is the Holy Bible. It is the inspired word of the living God. That's why Paul had to write those words of warning to the churches of Galatia. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon or so quickly removing from him that called you in the grace of Christ and do a different gospel, which is not another gospel, only there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, should preach unto you any other gospel than that which we have preached unto you, let him be anathema, or let him be accursed. Matthew 15, 8. Jesus said, This people honoreth me and draw nigh to me with their mouth, but honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. The light of God's word is desperately needed in this world Amen. that is filled in the darkness of sin. That is why we are to take the gospel to every creature, to the whole creation. There is so much of this creation that does not know the word of the living God. For about a dozen years, I served as a substitute teacher, mainly on the high school level. I was teaching in Copperas Cove, Texas on one occasion. There were about 40 in the class that I was teaching. It was a course of, uh, about the laws of the land. Uh, American history was the subject. And not to do any preaching, which could get me in trouble, I made a passing comment about law and how Moses was known as the lawgiver. A junior in high school a junior in high school held up his hand and asked this question. Mr. Whitlock, who is Moses? Who is Moses? I, I would never have believed that in the high school that I attended in Duncan, Oklahoma, graduating in 1967. But just five, six short years ago, a junior in high school held up his hand. Who is Moses? My children and my children's children know who Moses is. We have been warned. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This nation does not get back to God very, very soon. I fear for the future of America. Oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me, writes the psalmist in Psalm 43, verse 3. In Psalm 119, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Look at the board. Look at that number one. The builder and the type and the antitype is only one. The vessel of salvation and the type and the antitype is only one. The material and the type and the antitype 
is only one. The entrance and the top and the anti-top is only one. The source of light and the top and the anti-top, there's only one. And then something very, very strange happens to our lesson in topology. It is true that the number one has dominated this entire discussion. But then we get to the end of the lesson and we discover that although there is one builder, one vessel, one material, one entrance, and one light, there are actually two destinies. There are two destinies. In the ark, there is salvation. Outside of the ark, there is total destruction. In the church, there is salvation. Outside of the church that Christ built, there is eternal damnation. In all of these types and antitypes, we have found perfect agreement, point by point by point, discussing each one very briefly. And yet, the denominational and the interdenominational world claims, while we can be in any one of 750 plus man-made churches, and we can have salvation in any one of them, so worship at the church of your choice. It really does not matter. It does not matter, they say. Now, at the very place in the Bible, when they will pick up their New Testament and show me where they can find salvation in any one of 750 plus man-made churches, that being the antitype I will then gladly turn back to the type and show to them book, chapter, and verse for how 750 people were saved outside the ark. But if they cannot find in the New Testament where man has salvation in 750 plus man-made churches, then may it become as ridiculous for them to make such an argument as it is for me to have the audacity and the nerve to prepare a lesson and entitle that lesson how 750 people were saved outside the ark. Two destinies. There are those who were saved because they were in the ark. But the overwhelming majority did not find salvation. And so the choice comes to you and to me tonight. We can either be saved or we can be lost. And that is in our hands as to what we will do. Think about this and the lesson is yours. Generally speaking, people do not comprehend how much greater one billion is as opposed to one million. One million seconds is 11 days, but one billion seconds is 31 and a half days. And eternity All of the seconds of all time, from the beginning until now, and then repeated a hundred thousand times, a hundred thousand million times, a hundred thousand million billion, and eternity has only just begun. Eternity will never end. And eternity is going to be made up of only two groups of people. One group is saved, the other group is lost. Recently, I read an edition of House to House, Heart to Heart about the soldier's home 
in Liverpool. There was a fire one night in that home, and there were men on the top floor. They were wave, 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 waving out the window saying, help, help. There was a fire escape, but it was on the floor below that top floor. A very tall ladder was brought, but that ladder was not sufficient to reach all the way up to that top floor. It simply could not get the job done. A British sailor came by. He saw the situation. He understood what was going on. And so immediately, he took it upon himself to climb up that ladder. He got to the very top rung of that ladder and took a firm stronghold. And then he took his hands and put on the windowsill just a few feet above him. And he said, men, climb over me, climb down to the ladder. And they did so. And every single man on that top floor was saved. But it took the length of that man. Man was lost in sin. Man could not save himself. It would take one man who is willing to take our place. And that man is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He spread out his arms, and he was spread eagled upon a Roman cross. Roman soldiers took thin slivers of steel, pounded them into his precious hands and feet, and ever so slowly that cross was raised until finally it reached its apex, and then it was allowed to fall into the prepared hole in the ground with a dull and resounding thud. Those nearby more than likely heard the tearing of holy flesh. They may even have heard a holy groan. And Jesus Christ suffered and died for my sins and for yours. And Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, up upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Would you, as one who is outside of the body of Christ tonight, Respond to heaven's invitation, believing that Jesus is the Christ, repenting of all sin in your life, confessing his powerful name before this audience assembled tonight, and you can be buried in the waters of baptism, and all past sin of your life will be washed away. It could be that there is one tonight as a Christian who might need the prayers of those brethren who are here. Brethren here love you and care for you and concern for you. If you need to respond to heaven's invitation, why not do so now? We stand, we sing the song selected. When the trumpet of the Lord shook down and burst, there shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll Call up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun let us talk of all its wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there.